So now it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to Dr. Jim Crisp. As I mentioned before, he is an Associate Professor of History at North Carolina State University, uh, uh, but he is a native Texan. And he is a graduate of Rice University. He has his PhD in history from, from Yale. Uh, Dr. Crisp is an authority on the Texas Revolution uh, with some groundbreaking studies on many phases of the revolution, including those pertaining to the Alamo, Goliad, and San Jacinto. Uh, Dr. Crisp is no stranger to this symposium. He uh, spoke at the first symposium. He was an advisor last year. And I'm very happy that he has agreed to moderate today and, if necessary, referee. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Crisp. Again, thank you. <laughs> I'm really honored to be here uh, three times in a row. Um, I was very pleased uh, that uh, Jeff had asked me to speak the first time and pleased uh, that I survived since I told that gathered group that you all had put the monument in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> should be at Mrs. Powell's Tavern, but that's a point of de debate. I didn't think I was going to make it to the second uh, annual uh, San Jacinto Symposium, and then I saw the uh, the uh, program that Jeff had put together. And uh, I stayed in Texas longer than I planned that spring just to see the fireworks. Uh, uh, and I'm especially honored to come back in this capacity uh, this year and to be able to introduce uh, uh, four speakers uh, whose, whose work I, I, know, I know well and, 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 and admire and who I uh, am pleased to say I can uh, uh, name as, as, as friends. Um, I think it was Winston Churchill that used the term the hinge of fate when he was talking about the darkest days of World, of world War II uh, in a completely different scale, but maybe the same kind of context. It might be possible to talk about uh, the Battle of San Jacinto uh, as a hinge of fate, whether it happened there by the river or over at Mrs. Powell's Tavern or as Greg Demick will tell us at lunch uh, in the Mar de Lodo. Uh, the San Jacinto campaign, however you want to put the specific turning point, is certainly a turning point in North American history and in the relationship between Mexico and the United States, which is the focus of our symposium today. What happened with the Texas Revolution is that that relationship, which had become increasingly troubled over the decades as the two cultures and the two peoples came to meet uh, on what are now the plains of Texas, uh, as that relationship in the Texas Revolution turned to outright violence, uh, a violence that continued for many decades and which has certainly continued till this very day uh, to vex the relationship uh, even in the form of memory uh, uh, between the two nations. Uh, it's not an insult, though, to the people who fought in the Texas Revolution to say that, that this continental struggle was played out in microcosm, if not in miniature, uh, in Texas. Uh, there, it, it was, the Texas Revolution was fought on a very human scale uh, in which the actions of just a few individuals at certain times and certain places could play decisive roles, um, in which individual strengths and weaknesses uh, were magnified by the consequences that occurred as a result of those actions. Uh, when a handful of men can shift the fate of nations, um, they become uh, the point of our curiosity and they become the focus of our attention. And I expect that that's why many of us are here today. What they did in the spring of 1836, uh, for good or ill, uh, shaped the actual lives of most of us in the room today. Had those events of 1836 played out in a different way, uh, certainly our lives would either not uh, exist or not exist in this particular part of the world in quite this way. Under the magnifying glass of historical inquiry, the San Jacinto campaign reveals, certainly in its military aspects, 
the impressive strengths and the glaring weaknesses of both sides. Often these weaknesses took the form of excess, perhaps best represented in the personality of Santa Ana, what happens when too much supreme authority is placed in what may be uh, irresponsible hands. Uh, in Texas, a rather different society and a projection of that Anglo-American, especially Southern Anglo-American society, uh, perhaps the excesses were, via, were revealed in an excess of democracy, uh, an excess of democracy that not only took shape in the chaos of command uh, between uh, the beginning and the end of that campaign that nearly sunk the revolution as winter turned to spring on the, uh, in, in South Texas, but also in the aftermath of the revolution in that excess of democracy that Alexis de Tocqueville called uh, the tyranny of the majority. Um, Tocqueville looked at, at race in the United States when he visited here from France, I'm sorry, in, uh, in the 1830s. Uh, uh, when, when, when he saw the potential tyranny of the majority and the complication of race, uh, Tocqueville was not especially optimistic about how those forces might play themselves out. And certainly it can be argued that what developed here in the aftermath of 1836 is what the sociologist Pierre Vandenberg called a herrenfolk democracy, a democracy for the ruling folk, for the ruling race. Um, there's no doubt that <clears throat> the aftermath of San Jacinto and the coming of the Texas Republic fastened slavery on this place, fastened slavery to the extent that by the time the Civil War broke out in 1861, one out of three Texans was legally in chains. And that's not something we can be proud of. It made increasingly vulnerable the fate of free people of color in, the, in, in, this, in this area. Um, it became literally, you became literally vulnerable to expulsion uh, from the Texas Republic if you were a free person uh, whose, whose skin was the wrong color. And the increasing vulnerability of Tejanos is a well-known story. Uh, no matter what their role had been in the revolution, many men were streaming into Texas, becoming citizens of Texas uh, immediately, and looking for Mexicans to fight, even if those Mexicans happened to be De Leon's or Seguin's. Our first speakers today will take a long and broad look at San Jacinto and the Texas Revolution from two perspectives, not the only two perspectives but from two perspectives. This is not in the form of a debate over which one of our next two speakers is telling you the truth, but in the form of a dialogue describing the way that people of different perspectives and having different experiences can see and interpret the same events in very different ways. We know that today neither the Alamo nor Goliad nor San Jacinto have a single meaning for Texans. When I took Texas history in the seventh grade in the 1950s, tech, the, term tex, <clears throat> pardon me, the term Texan was not very inclusive. Uh, and I got a very narrow story of what had happened during the Texas Revolution and what had happened in Texas since that revolution. Uh, a one-dimensional story of heroic and successful whites. Uh, that wasn't working as a legitimate or believable story by the end of the 20th century, and it's not gonna work in the 21st century when this becomes a white minority state. The attitudes and perspectives uh, that uh, are represented by the whole breadth of Texan society today is something that will shape the way we view history. Um, and we're taking part in that transformation and ongoing evolution of the way we see the history of Texas today. I first met Bruce Wenders when he had not long been the curator and historian at the Alamo 
Uh, it was the BBC, I think, actually, Bruce, that brought us together when they were doing a documentary uh, on the Della Pena diary. Uh, that was like being thrown in the briar patch for me when they said, would you come to Texas uh, and, uh, and go to the Alamo and help us do this? Uh, and since then, I have been so impressed by uh, what uh, Bruce and his, uh, and his fellow uh, workers uh, in all capacities at the, uh, at the Alamo uh, have done. Um, Bruce was, to my great amazement, I discovered this in El Paso three weeks ago, um, trained as a geologist. Um, that's really not so far a stretch from being a historian. One of the most remarkable books that I've read, a brand new book out of Oxford University Press by John Lewis Gaddis, is The Landscape of History, How Historians Map the Past. And one of the points he makes is that both historians and geologists and evolutionary biologists and cosmologists and a great many other scientists take a look at the structures that we see around us and given that evidence, try to understand the processes which brought these structures about. Uh, so training as a geologist might not be such a bad way to get started uh, in the business of history. When you dig, the story changes. That's true for the geologist, that's true for the anthropologist, for the archeologist like Greg Dimmick, and for the historian. And so a, a working historian, a digging historian, is by definition a revisionist historian. Uh, so we can all glory in that name, I hope. He was trained at Murray State University in that Department of Geology, took his master's degree at the University of Texas at Arlington, uh, where he wrote about Mississippi volunteer companies in northern Mexico, and then expanded his dissertation at TCU into Mr. Polk's Army, Politics, Patronage, and the American Military in the, in the Mexican War. Uh, Bruce just keeps turning out books which win prizes. Uh, Mr. Polk's Army was awarded the Jerry Coffey Memorial Book Prize in 1997. Uh, the in, the uh, remarkable book that he co-edited with, uh, with Donnie Frazier and, and uh, who was your third editor? Uh, Sam, Haynes. Sam Haynes, the United States and Mexico at War, uh, was awarded the Sanchez Lamego Prize. Thank you. Uh, in 1999. Uh, gee, there's six more books here that he wrote. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they didn't want me to talk about those, I guess. Uh, uh, was that a signal that I shouldn't mention all this? Um, and, in, and in 2003, uh, a book that I just gave a fabulous review to because it was a fabulous book, uh, Crisis in the Southwest, was the winner of the Summerfield G. Roberts Award by the Sons of the Republic of Texas. Um, there is obviously a lot more that I can say about Bruce. I will only say that he practices what he preaches. Uh, what he preaches, and I heard him preach this in El Paso just a few weeks ago, is that education is a lifelong endeavor. And certainly in his work at the Alamo, he is showing that every day. Uh, I will introduce Raul Ramos uh, after Bruce has finished with his presentation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, to be able to look out and see all of you out there. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I don't have anything written down, nothing's on my hands, <laughs> nothing up my sleeve, but I want to uh, talk to you about the Battle at San Jacinto and the, in the context of some larger events. At the Alamo, one of the things that we often have to deal with is people will come up to us and they'll say, well, tell us about the Texas Revolution. You know, was it a battle between the Texans and the Mexicans? And for most people, the visual image that they get is the Texan is some white guy who came from Tennessee, and the Mexican is somebody who's of darker color. But there's clearly visually differences in what people think when they say Texans and, and Mexicans. And uh, at dinner last night, one of the things we were talking about is when you, at this time period in the 1830s, when you talk about Texans, you have to say, well, which Texans do you mean? Do you mean the native-born Texans? Do you mean the naturalized Texans who came in through the immigration system? 
or do you mean the illegal ones who came across the border so it isn't necessarily something that's just cut and dry same thing for the for the mexicans at that time in texas what do you mean stephen f austin we think of him as being a texan but he certainly was a citizen of mexico and so it, it's much more confusing sometimes than just to say, wasn't it like this or and this? The, uh, the Battle of San Jacinto often is one of those things. I, I taught in public school for a while, and I've read a lot of Texas history. Usually when you get to the Battle of San Jacinto in the study of the Texas Revolution, you get the sense that this battle occurred and they all lived happily ever after. You really get the sense that it's finality and that you're going on to something else. So the battle takes place, the Republic is born, and then we turn the page and go on to the next chapter. And one of the things that I found out about teaching was that uh, you may find this somewhat surprising, but uh, a lot of people don't like history. <laughs> and if you've, if you've taught in a history class and you know that much of your audience doesn't really like what you have to say. It uh, it is cause for you know why why is, is it that people don't like history? And what I decided was that they don't like history because it's taught as facts, taught as dates, taught as people, taught as unrelated incidents. And having been a uh, life earth science teacher at one time and and walked students through dissecting worms and other things, I learned to look at things in, in detail. How are they related? And I, I guess I've applied that to history. And what I found was that as we teach history, what we tend to do is we, we wrap it up and say, here's a, here's a chapter. You know, read about this chapter in history. You're going to have a test on it. Then we're going to read another chapter. You'll have a test on that. But there's this idea that each thing is a separate episode is being rather connected. And so for San Jacinto, the idea of it being an endpoint to me is not as complete as it being more or less a turning point. And for it to be a turning point, we, we have to discuss, well, what's on one side of it and then what's on the other side of it. On the events leading up to San Jacinto, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you a day-by-day -day account of the Texas Revolution because I think we probably have some pretty good Texas historians out there at these tables, but I do want to put it into a context that will, again, bring home to the fact, you know, why is this such a dramatic event? And when the revolution had broken out in October of 1835, and you look at the, I'm going to have to break my own rule, when you look at the Texans, when you look at the insurgents, things are going extremely well for them. And so you have to put your place, you have to put yourself in their place. The revolution's broken out, things are going well. You have centralist garrisons that are being rounded up, being forced out of Texas. So of course at places like Goliad, you have the encirclement at San Antonio de Bejar. And that is not quite as easy as some of the other victories, but after this battle of nearly five days fighting house to house, General Coase is defeated and his army signs a parole and marches out of Texas. So in this phase of the Texas Revolution, everything looks like it's doing very well for the insurgents. So it's bad for the government, good for the insurgents. And victory, you can almost sense this in the events of today. It's one thing to win, and then it's another thing to be able to shape the peace that follows. So, of course, I'm alluding to uh, what's occurring in Iraq right now. And the Texans had been successful at forcing the centralists out, but then they begin to disagree on what the next step should be. Some are of the mind that we forced them to leave, we won the war. Others are more knowledgeable and believe that the Mexicans will come back and say we have to prepare for that. There's a group that says, well, if we're going to fight Santa Ana, let's do it on the frontier. And so these people end up at places like 
San Antonio, at the Alamo. You have others that say the way to proceed with this war is to take the war to Mexico. So you have an expedition gotten up with the destination to go to Matamoros. But the, what's happening is that there is no unifying governing body in Texas at that time. The armies are more or less independent armies. The government that has formed, the governor has dismissed the council. The council has kicked out the governor, put in their own person. And uh, this is sort of summed up in a letter that I, that I like, and it's a, a, an officer writing to, to the governor saying, I'm sending a copy of this, I'm paraphrasing, I'm sending a copy of this to both you and the council, not knowing who actually is in charge. And so if that's the sense that they have, um, this is not going to be a good situation. And what happens is that Santa Ana does come back, and he doesn't come back with an army of 16,000, or 10,000, but he does come back with a substantial force. It's divided into two columns. He comes back to San Antonio. Another column goes towards the Goliad area. And the, these early victories that have happened for the Texans are erased. You have the Alamo fall with its garrison being put to the sword. You have uh, at, at Goliad, where the Matamoros expedition had more or less bogged down. You have General Urea who comes, gobbles up small detachments of Texans, and then defeats Fannin out on the prairie. And then you have the week leading up to the massacre at Goliad where nearly 400 American volunteers are taken out and executed. So you've gone from, on the Texan viewpoint, you've gone from this wild sense of victory to this impending doom. And one of the things that uh, is happening at that time is when you study Alamo history, there's a sense that, that Colonel Travis is writing letters, he's sending them out, and nobody is responding. You know, people are responding, it just takes, you have to think of transportation, you have to think of communications at that time. The 32 men from Gonzales come, but it is stirring people up. They just don't get there in time. One of the things about his, his letters is he's not the only person to talk in these terms, but he talks about victory or death. And it becomes apparent because of the executions that follow these centralist victories that it is going to necessarily be victory or death. You're going to have to win this war you're going to be killed, or the third alternative is to withdraw back to Louisiana. So what it does is serve as that you know, famous rallying cry. Now, as we said, victory can be somewhat disorganizing. And for Santa Ana, Santa Ana is disorganized by his victories as well. And what happens is he, he grows careless, and he grows very condescending towards the, the fighting ability of his enemy. Now, what are we doing in Iraq right now? We're passing out, if I had playing cards with me, we could hold up and identify these people, but the fighting has, has, has died down, and now we're going after the revolutionary leaders. Well, same thing is happening in Texas at that time. The fighting appeared to have died down, and Santa Ana wants to capture the leaders of the revolution. And so he takes a small detachment and he dashes ahead towards Harrisburg and he gets out of supporting distance of his main army. Later, this is the group that Sam Houston hears about being in the modern Houston area. And Santa Ana will send for reinforcements, but when Sam Houston finds defeats and captures Santa Ana, it's not the entire centralist army, it's just the portion that's with Sam Houston, or excuse me, with Santa Ana out, out ahead of uh, supporting distance. Now, 
we could stop at that point we could say these texan reverses have been avenged the texans are winning the texans won and that's the end of the story that's that's the end of the chapter but again this is a not necessarily an, an end point but this is a turning point what we tell people who come to the Alamo is that if you're going to understand the Texas Revolution you have to be able to understand it in the context of an ongoing Mexican Civil War and what often gets out of left out of Texas history is the the uh, the Mexican component and what we talk about when we talk about the Texas Revolution essentially Texas was not Texas by itself it's part of Coahuila and Texas and so it helps to know what it is that's going on in Coahuila and Texas, of which Texas is a part of, and going on in Mexico as Mexico is the, uh, well, owns Texas at that time. And what had been going on was an ongoing civil war in Mexico between political factions. And those political factions are the today what we call centralist, I've already said centralist with Santa Ana, and a group called federalist or republicans. And if you think back to Iraq again, when one government is ended, the idea is what do you replace it with? And when we talk about the American Revolution, often we talk about the American Revolution just saying, well, it's a revolution. And we use that word so much it doesn't really have any significance. But when you think about the American Revolution, it is a, it's a true revolution in the sense that it changes world politics. It changes the government, how things are set up in the world. That you go from having monarchies to having republics. In a monarchy you have the king or queen or empress or emperor and you have subjects and the power flows from the top down in the ideal of the republic the people are the government power flows to the top so it's 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 a complete reversal of the of the way authority is proposed in government when mexico declared its independence in 1821 it had the choice of deciding We've done away with the Spanish government. What are we going to be? And you have this idea that revolutions do cause social instability. And there are a group of people in Mexico that are afraid of the social changes that will be brought by a revolution. And essentially what they want to do is to replicate the stability of the old Spanish system with a king of their own choosing. And when they cannot find a king, one of the things that happens early on in this Republic of Mexico history is you have a military officer who steps forward and essentially names himself the Emperor of Mexico. And this lasts for about a year and a half. And Iturbide is then deposed. And you have the choice offered again. There are two, two choices. One is a group who call themselves centralist, and they want the stability of the old Spanish system. But they don't necessarily want a king. But they do want the stability and the bureaucracy that brings social order. Then you have this other group who are called Republicans or Federalists. And they're the ones who have been touched by ideas of the American Revolution, of the French Revolution. They're the ones that are going, if you look at the United States, they're actually progressing. And they're progressing because it's their form of government. And so you have people in Mexico who want to replicate, not exactly, but they like the idea behind the federal system, where you have a central government, but you have states like Coahuila in Texas that have, have some local autonomy. And so this is protected by the Constitution of 1824. And so when people, when we talked about legal, legal immigrants coming into Texas, when colonization is opened up, you have people coming from the United States that essentially believe they're going from one republic into another republic. And so this is 
part of the ideological underpinning for what will happen. Now, in Mexican politics at this time period, often what happens is you'll have a general who will run for office. If he doesn't have enough ballots, well, he certainly has enough bayonets. And so you have a series of, of revolts and counter-revolts where the centralists come to power, where the federalists come to power, more or less repeating the process. And by the time of the Texas Revolution, the state of Coahuila and Texas had a decidedly federalist ideology. And so what was happening was that Texas, as a part of Coahuila and Texas, was being pulled into this larger national civil war. And so that's one way you can look at it. You can look at it as an event that happens in Texas, or you can look at it in the larger context of what's happening in Mexico at that time. Now, as a turning point, after the, the reason you can say that San Jacinto is a turning point instead of an end point is because it does change the relationship between Texas and the Mexican government. Texas, although Mexico refuses to recognize its independence, Texas essentially is independent because Mexico never is able to reassert its authority over Texas. That doesn't mean that they didn't try, though. One of the things that, that uh, Greg will talk about is the retreat of the, the Mexican army following San Jacinto. But the retreat is just that. It's a withdrawal, and there's always this idea that somehow Mexico will come back to Texas and reclaim its lost territory. When we study, again, when we study Texas history, we're very proud of these different episodes like the Santa Fe expedition or the uh, Mir expedition where the black beans. This is part of this ongoing story. One of the things that happens is you have two key figures in the Republic of Texas. You have Sam Houston, Maribel D. Lamar. Houston tends to be very cautious in his approach to Mexico with the idea that they have problems of their own, and if we leave them alone, they'll leave us alone. But Lamar is much more aggressive and has a vision of extending Texas not just to the Rio Grande, and I'm not talking about the Rio Grande down at Laredo, but the Rio Grande at Santa Fe, New Mexico, but also has visions of the Pacific. And one of the things that Lamar does is to send an expedition to New Mexico to liberate it from the Mexican government. Well, that ends in disaster. It was, in hindsight, not a good idea. And one of those strange facts about history is the president of Mexico who had just re-entered re office was Santa Ana. And so Santa Ana, sort of uh, living out Houston's prediction, since they had been, since Mexico had been insulted by this expedition, plans to send troops in to Texas, and so you have the invasion of two invasions of San Antonio. The response of the Texans is to go after them, and then you have the Battle of Mier with the capture of Texans leading to the Black Bean episode down below Saltillo. All these things are connected. And again, the turning point aspect, rather than an end, is this war, this conflict between the Texans and the Mexicans continues. And when Texas is finally annexed by the United States, this war then is passed on to a larger stage and it becomes a war between the United States and Mexico with many of the same people who had participated in the Texas Revolution in the Republic era participating in this war with Mexico. The idea of it being a turning point is it is a turning point in U.S., or not necessarily U.S., but, but Texas-Mexican relationships, but it's also a turning point in, I don't 
not to be so grandiose, but it is a, it, it is a change in, in the course of, the, of world history. And by that, the implication is that with San Jacinto and the Republic of Texas leading to annexation, you have the United States growing as a continental power and then eventually growing into a global power. So again, you might not find very many people outside this room or outside the state of Texas that would, would look at San Jacinto as such a significant event, but it, it actually is. And uh, that's why I think that, that it's important that we, that we remember San Jacinto, but we try to put it in a larger context. And that's hopefully what I've been able to do for you today. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Well, Raul Ramos will be a new face to many of you. I'm pleased to say he's not a new face uh, to me. I ran into Raul and his parents in San Antonio in 1995 uh, as my uh, De La Pena adventures were just beginning and uh, have crossed paths with him many times uh, in Austin and other places as he and I have pursued our research into early Texas. I'm very pleased to say that today Raul Ramos is an assistant professor of history at the University of Houston, uh, partially because he was able to fly here so quickly. Uh, when we, I'm not kidding, he did have to fly. He found out uh, on uh, Tuesday, I believe, uh, that this event was taking place and that he might be a part of it. And we're very happy that uh, this last minute uh, miracle uh, has occurred. Uh, Raul is not just a guy we found on the street, however. His, uh, his, uh, his work on early Texas, and especially in the Mexican perspective on what's happening in early Texas between the 1820s and the 1860s, gives him a great deal of uh, insight into the issues that we're dealing with today. Uh, Raul was born in San Antonio, uh, went to Princeton University before uh, starting graduate school at Yale. Uh, his dissertation, uh, was on the transformation of identity from Norteño, uh, from the North Mexican identity to the Tejano uh, in San Antonio de Beja between 1811 and 1861. And that book is being, uh, that uh, dissertation is being turned into a book with the intriguing title, Changing Nations, Persistent Peoples, Nationalism and Ethnic Identity in Mexican San Antonio, 1811. 1861. I think that covers five of the six flags, doesn't it, uh, to get from 1811 to 1861? Uh, and leaving out the French is cool today, uh, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, Raul spent 2000-2001 uh, uh, as, a, as a Summerfield Roberts fellow, uh, fellow at the Clements Center for Southwest Studies at uh, SMU, where I think our paths again crossed, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, today he is a visiting scholar uh, at the Center for Mexican American Studies at the University of Houston. That doesn't mean he's not also an assistant professor, it, just does, it means he doesn't teach nearly as many courses. Uh, visit, visiting your own university in one of its centers is the ambition of most scholars uh, today who can't get somehow a, you know, a fellowship to go to Hawaii or something like that. Uh, but visiting your own place uh, and having the freedom not only to, uh, to pursue your research, but also to, to uh, respond to last minute desperate pleas from your fellow historians uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a good thing to, to, it's a good position to be in. And uh, I am just very happy uh, to give you uh, a, 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 a great person uh, and a good historian, Raul Ramos. Or was it a good person and a great historian? I think that was it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim, for that kind inter introduction. I uh, feel like you're uh, becoming something of a padrino for me, uh, both in the Mexican sense and perhaps in the uh, mafia sense as well. Um, the, uh, it's, it's a double-edged sword in this case. Um, good morning. I'm, hap I'm very excited to be here in front of you today to um, talk about um, the general topic of, of Mexico-U.S. relations after San Jacinto. Uh, 
but I'm also here because uh, I'm replacing a speaker, and I could not do justice to his work, so I'm not going to follow his, uh, his lecture. In fact, I've retitled my lecture, Irreparable Damage, question mark, the Texas Rebellion in U.S.-Mexico Relations. Um, I also kind of feel like one of my students, they're in finals right now and, uh, you know, writing papers last minute, and burning the midnight oil and, uh, and staying up. So uh, I think I can sympathize with them when I read their papers this weekend. Now I'm going to read some of my paper also because I've, I've uh, been preparing this in, in such a hurried fashion. Um, and, and just to explain a little bit about what I do, my particular interest in this period is, uh, is an examination of the Mexican population in, in what is now Texas. Now, calling someone a, it, this goes along with what Bruce was saying, it, it's a little difficult to call someone a Mexican Texan, especially in the period I'm writing about, is, is sort of redundant. Uh, they're all Mexican at this point. Uh, I, one term that I use as a sort of shorthand is the term Tejano. Um, not necessarily used during that time, much uh, used uh, more uh, in the present, but I'm using it as a way to refer to that Mexican ethnic, Mexican national uh, or racial population um, at the time. Now I've spent uh, the greater part of the last, uh, last 18 years in other parts of the country and, and I recently took this job at the University of Houston in, in their history department. And um, my welcome back to Texas took a rather interesting form. I was asked by a local state senator to put together a brief memo on the significance of Juan Seguin to Texas independence. This is the, previ uh, the previous legisla le legislative session. This memo would support his bill to rename the highway to the San Jacinto Monument after Juan Seguin. I later found out that that uh, bill did not uh, pass unchanged, and in fact, Seguin didn't get a highway named after him, but instead he got a highway interchange named after him. Some of you might have uh, might be, go by this interchange uh, frequently. Uh, when I saw how sort of this process of how history is brought into the present, how we we look at the uh, how we we remember people and remember um, the past it showed me that clearly I have a lot of work to do ahead of me. But uh, once uh, ever the eternal optimist, I decided that I could still talk about this highway interchange as somehow being symbolic of Juan Seguin and the sort of pretzel he had to contort himself into uh, in order to deal with the various national forces that were pulling and tugging at him uh, from all sides. So uh, we, we can, as historians can always write meaning into uh, what is out there. Now, while we're gathered here today to study and continue to unearth, literally sometimes, the complex history of what happened at San Jacinto a century and a half ago, I can't help but consider the status of relations between the United States and Mexico in the present. Nowhere is this more evident than in the very vocal, and as it turns out critical to the United Nations, opposition by the vast majority of Mexicans to the American invasion of Iraq. Now, Bruce has spent some time discussing this metaphor of Iraq, and I'm sorry I'm going to continue on this, but um, I have a point to make, you'll see. Mexican public opinion polls put this opposition somewhere in the order of at least 75% and up to perhaps 95%. So this is a significant portion of the Mexican population. Uh, the 75% figure comes from the uh, Washington Post two days ago. Despite close political and economic ties between these two neighbors, these statistics indicate an immense perception gap exists between large segments of both populations. I would like to propose this morning that unexamined and unresolved debates beginning with the secession of Texas from Mexico might help us understand one element of where this perception gap originates. In a sense, looking at the deep impact of San Jacinto on Mexican and American culture helps us understand something about the world around us today. If we are to look at San Jacinto as a turning point, as Bruce pointed out, uh, then we need to look at, well, the situation before 1836. Although American designs on Texas had been overtly 
and covertly made to the Spanish government, most, uh, most uh, officials in New Spain believed that the adams onis Treaty in 1819 put those fears to rest. So there were, they knew there were designs on Texas, but there was a feeling that that was something of a frontier period and perhaps that was over. Evidence of just how far back those fears were put away came with the introduction of the Empresario land grant system into Texas in the same year that Mexico won its independence from Spain. I'm, I'm always struggling to figure out you know, who made the decision to, uh, to pass the law of colonization, but clearly this was an interest that local folks in Coahuila y Texas had, uh, and they were uh, already working on this before independence. Indeed, Austin went to great lengths to prove his allegiance to Mexico as well, not only politically, but, but, but personally as well, befriending elite Tejanos, such as Erasmo Seguin. And, and in many cases, when his uh, colonies were put to the test of allegiance, such as the Fredonia Rebellion, he answered in the affirmative that he is indeed a Mexican citizen. In a relatively short period of time, though, Mexican officials began to suspect the empresario colonization system might not be working out. Mexico City sent a commission led by Manuel Mieriteran to study the Anglo colonies and report on their progress. It is then that we get the first reports that large groups of Anglo colonists were not only thumbing their noses at Mexican government policies, but mistreating Tejanos living amongst them. Mieriteran wrote, commenting on, on these impoverished Mexicans he saw in these Anglo colonies. From such a state of affairs should arise an antagonism between the Mexicans and foreigners, which is not the least of the smoldering fires which I have discovered. So Mieri Teran is going with his commission into these colonies and realizing that basically the difference between Alabama and Texas is less than the difference between Saltillo and uh, East Texas. This has now become a place foreign even to Mexicans. And this was a problem. The Mexican government instituted measures to attempt to curb this problem, but the rapid immigration of Americans into Mexico made a, any radical change more, that much more difficult. Legislation such as the law of April 6, 1830 only served to make larger the rift Mieriteran discovered. By now we're familiar with the sequence of events that led to a rebellion in Texas and a secession at the Battle of San Jacinto. But what's important to note is it's my feeling that the law, the, the, this law of, of 1830 in fact served as a, a polarizing moment. One where you, you would have a you, you did, and you continue to have a diversity of beliefs and opinions among the Anglo-American immigrants into Texas. But particular voices were, in a sense, legitimized, were made more important after the law of 1830. It was a kind of, I told you so. See, the Mexicans, they don't want us here. You know? And in a sense, that made any kind of, of negotiating, any kind of bridge building, difficult. Within, within the Anglo-American community, uh, uh, colonies, not to mention you know, trying to deal with Mexico after that. You know, even internally, this was becoming increasingly difficult. So what changed after San Jacinto? Just as the law of April 6, 1830, reinforced negative beliefs many American immigrants had of their, uh, of of Mexicans in the Mexican government, Texas secession supported and inflamed the worst fears Mexicans held of Americans. So here we have, in a sense, another, uh, another polarizing moment that, that, uh, uh, with the Battle of San Jacinto. This appears almost immediately after San Jacinto when commentators and congressmen in Mexico began to debate the official status of Texas and whether or not Texas should be reconquered. 
La Reconquista de Texas, as it was occasionally referred to, was thought to, was thought to guarantee a way to create a buffer from further American expansionism. In fact, there was uh, a plan that was floated around that uh, Mexico would, would uh, that, that Mexico had different options. They could reconquer Texas. Um, another option in sort of middle road uh, that I'll talk about um, further is that they could also um, support Texas uh, or, or excuse me, recognize Texas as independence, but with a stipulation of bringing in uh, French and British um, guards to keep the border uh, between um, Texas and the United States uh, firm. Reconquista rhetoric appeared frequently in the Mexican press beginning in 1837, first in Mexico City and later filtering up northward. The, new, the newspaper Imparcial, founded in June 1837, devoted editorial coverage to Texas throughout its entire run of 45 issues. Later that year, a publisher in Puebla printed the pam pamphlet Ligeras Indicaciones sobre la Usurpación de Texas. It is worth quoting this pamphlet at greater length, and I'll, I'll quote it in my translation, so, so uh, you won't have to um, translate yourself. The Mexican provinces have, for years, been the implacable envy and ambition of Anglo-Americans. The day that the government from Washington holds domain over us will be the day in which will disappear from our land our Catholic religion, and our fate shall be the same as the indigenous people from those lands deprived of the most imperceptible benefits of civilization and of the enslaved descendants of Africa that suffer the horrors of tyranny. So again, you see that polarizing effect that, that this commentator saying, we've known all along that they've had design on, designs on Texas, uh, I told you so. By July 11, 1839, uh, General Tornel, Jose Maria Tornel, wrote to the Mexican legislature, legislature from Monterrey that the government should, quote, fix its sights on the Department of Texas and understand that this opportunity to bring it back into the heart of the, what he, the term he uses, Gran Familia Mexicana, should not be passed up. So we have here a couple of issues. One is Mexico, remember, Mexico is still a young nation. And even this idea of, of what a nation is, 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 is a young idea in global history. But one thing was certain that territorial integrity was an important aspect of nation and of maintaining nation. So it was a test, in other words, for this young nation. Plans for the Reconquista met with the reality of Mexico's economic and political situation. Without directly opposing the idea of, recon of reconquest, El Realtor, published in Monterrey, presented a series of editorials critical of Mexico's ability to reincorporate Texas. In July 1838, the editor wrote, in this manner, the few colonists of Texas have enjoyed and reveled in their triumph without a minimal effort in two years, uh, effort by the Mexican government, to recover territorial, integ territorial integrity and national dignity. Mexicans in, in, uh, Mexicans in Monterrey experienced the War of Texas Secession from a closer perspective and thus provided a different point of view regarding the possibility of reconquest. They saw this as we've already gone too far. Texas is too entrenched. On the other hand, La Luna, printed in Chihuahua, provided a stronger argument in June of 1841. The editor, editors noted, war with Texas and the expulsion of its usurpers is the necessity of the present and more than the present, the necessity of the future. And again, there's all, there's for a lot, for, in, in many of these statements about reconquest, there's echoes of, you know, it's not just about Texas. And I think that's what's, uh, what's interesting here, that it's about something larger. It's about territorial integrity. It's about further expansion. Uh, and, 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 and that's sort of looming over the horizon. The, Re the Reconquista debate portrayed Texas Republic government in negative terms, revealing, through, uh, their, revealing their thoughts on Anglo-Americans. One newspaper noted the New Mexican success in preventing Anglo colonization. New Mexicans, the journalist wrote, in this case he's referring to the Santa Fe expedition, 
fig, quote, figured out how to make those irritating adventurers that dream in their whiskey vapor induced fantasies about conquering another territory eat dirt. <laughs> I'm giving you another perspective here. <laughs> Mexicans also feared an, an invasion by the Texas Republic, fueled by this Anglo-Texan hunger for land. Upon hearing rumors that Texas received funds from Havana, one paper wrote, certainly Texans could not have found a better resource than the one place where the first adventures originated insurrections. Sort of a training ground. After the secession of Texas, most Mexicans believed the entire nation stood exposed to Anglo-American land grabbing. An editorial in 1845 noted, but we forget that that same race holds an unquenchable thirst for land. So, and you see that repeated. You, you see the repetition of, 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 a, of a thirst for land, of, of um, treatment of indigenous people, of Indians, treatment of uh, the enslavement of African people. Again, slavery was banned in Mexico. So these are seen as, uh, as not just descriptors of Americans, these are actual character flaws of these Americans. Texas was not reconquered after all. I mean, we know about the expeditions, the Vasquez expedition and the Wall expedition, which played a very important role, uh, not necessarily in terms of Mexico, I would say, but in terms of the Mexican population that stayed in Texas. But the debate continued over whether to officially recognize the Texas Republic with the participation of France and Britain, as I said, to maintain the border with the United States. But continued internal schisms around centralism and federalism prevented Mexico from acting decisively. Essentially, they didn't do anything because there was never uh, enough, no, nobody had enough power to, do, to, to get popular support, to get political support, to do one thing or another, reconquer, uh, or something, it was, it, was too, it was too complicated. Furthermore, the tone around Texas, noted in the quotes that I mentioned, um, prevented, uh, excuse me, made the political costs of recognizing Texas independence too high. I mean, you would be, you, you, I, I suppose it's like Carter giving away the Panama Canal or something like that. Uh, uh, so um, th that, uh, that would have uh, been worse though for Mexico. In the end, the fears of American territorial expansion initiated by Texas played out in the American invasion of Mexico. So, we, so these fears, in a sense, were legitimate. And, and that's where we get to the point when we're, when we're looking at where San Jacinto stands. It polarized and at the same time made possible this more extended expansion of the United States. In other words, for Mexicans, Texas was first a problem dealing, a problem that arose out of a federalist centralist division, but it was also the first step in a larger American design to to uh, expand its land over Mexican land to the Pacific Ocean to annex Mexico. But it's easy, but as easy it is, as it is to discuss these tensions as merely antagonisms between two nation states or, or two cultures, um, it's also possible to forget that these perceptions more immediately and more dramatically affected Mexicans living in Texas. After all, Mexicans didn't disappear after San Jacinto. And they didn't assimilate either. And that's, the, that's that middle role that we're talking about. Here's Juan Seguin starting to contort. And we must also remember that this that the, these Mexicans living that in San Antonio, or in fact, uh, 
these Tejanos living in their homes witnessed the most violent episodes of the, the uh, Texas Rebellion in their, from their own homes. I mean, the first battle for San Antonio, the one where, where the uh, Army of Texas occupies San Antonio and, and expels the, the governor and the Mexican army, uh, was a house-to-house -house fight. It was a siege of San Antonio. Um, this was a great price to pay in order to basically keep your home, to keep your homeland. Now, these, but nevertheless, there's, the, there's what's happening on the ground level, but there's still the issue of these Mexican Amer and American relations. How did these, how did this tension that, I, that I'm describing that starts in 1830 on the one side, continues to San Jacinto on the other side, how did it affect the Mexican population? Well, first off, it created a deep distrust of, of Mexicans in Texas after San Jacinto. Bejareños, the, the original inhabitants of, of Bejar, San Antonio de Bejar, were made to sign loyalty oaths in order to receive their head right grants, their head right uh, grants from, uh, fr uh, from the Texas Republic. That were head, loyalty oaths that were written very specifically to their situation in San Antonio as, as, as being a, a, a population that was occupied. Not only that, but continued contact with Federalist, federalist leaders in Mexico resulted in continued involvement in internal Mexican politics. As Bruce, uh, as Dr. Winder pointed out, the Central's Federalist problem didn't end there. And in fact, Texas was still very much in play, if you will, in the Central, Centralist Federalist schism. You had Federalists who felt here was a chance to, to maybe get Texan, Texans on their side and really mount an, uh, a serious military opposition to the centralist government. On top of that, these, the fact that these two nations couldn't settle for internal and external reasons, couldn't settle on a policy, made border troubles, made border violence and raiding more prevalent. And finally, and I think mo most dramatically, what this tone and the, this perception gap, if you will, did is it created a polarized political and cultural view. In other words, Mexican was bad, Anglo-American was good, and there was no in between. And the problem is, life is not that easy. Now, I want to end by reading two quotes. The invasion is only a beginning. We are in the presence of the start of a new imperialism in the globe. Second quote, this general rejection of a, col of a colonialist and racist attitude from the 19th century seeks to encourage a surging initiative in the Senate that that institution should articulate and control national foreign policy. What are these two quotes? Two quotes that would sound appropriate to Mexicans fearing conquest after San Jacinto. But in fact, they're both quotes from last month in Mexican newspaper editorials. The first, I took out a word, the invasion of Iraq is only a beginning. We are in the presence of, of, of the start of a new imperialism in the globe. The other, one, uh, the other one, I didn't change any words, but I pulled out of the context on an editorial uh, of Iraq. One is from El Norte, excuse me, Reforma, from Mexico City and El Universal, a more leftist paper in Mexico City. Reforma being a little more, more centralist paper. So we see here that, the, when we, the, what we see here is that Mexicans have grown to expect this from the United States, or maybe not expect it, but, but are used to it, let's say. Uh, one, uh, in a Washington Post article from uh, just a few days ago, um, 
the, a reporter from the Washington Post in Mexico City, Kevin Sullivan, is interviewing um, basically man on the street. And he describes his conversation. He says it's all about history. Mexicans are still deeply angered about losing half of their territory to the United States in the mid-19th century. In home and in school, Mexicans are taught that their land, currently known as Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and California, was stolen by an aggressive, arrogant US invasion for force. Quote, so when the United States goes to invade another country under a pretext, which is still not clear, there's a click in our subconscious, he said. It's part of our love-hate relationship with the United States. Now, uh, we could stop there and say, you know, again, drawing our analogy, perhaps Mexicans in Texas, Tejanos, uh, might not be Iraq, might not be the United States, they might be the UN in this case, trying to keep the two sides together, but realizing that the weight of the pressure wasn't able to hold and war breaks out. But there's a, there's a postscript here. And that postscript is that many, or several, of the soldiers who died fighting in Iraq were born and raised in Mexico. And a, a few of them were granted American citizenship posthumously. You see how the pretzel is getting more complicated here? It's not an easy answer. It's not e it's not, and, and when you read Mexican newspaper accounts of these soldiers who died, the headlines are, are startling. Mexican soldier dies in Iraq. Of course, you, you know, anybody knows that Mexico doesn't have troops in Iraq, so it's a soldier uh, who's fighting in the US Army. But again, being claimed as one of ours, by Mexico. So that's the postscript here. And I want to end by saying that I'm trying to raise difficult questions here, difficult tensions that are going on. And I just want to suggest one thing, that it's not a solution to just say, well, we agree to disagree. We owe it to future generations that if we're serious about making the past matter in the present, that we need only look at the front page of the newspaper and, the, and outside our front door to see where the questions for our research should begin. Thank you very much. Believe it or not, we're on schedule. Um, the time has come for the Q&A for your opportunity to ask very broad questions of scholars who have raised very broad issues. Um, I would like uh, each of our uh, speakers to test the mics there on the, we've got one working there, which I'll let them uh, trade off on. Uh, what I'd like you to do when you uh, will raise your hand and get my attention that you'd like to ask a question, uh, I'd like you to stand and state your question as loudly as possible. I'm told that we will not have a roving microphone we would wear someone silly trying to rove a microphone all over this very large room, I'm afraid, nor do we have a standing mic for you to come up to. So if you will ask your question as loudly as possible, I will repeat the question. For those of you who in the audience who have not heard it, this will give our two speakers critical seconds to think about an answer. Uh, <laughs> so that I'll repeat that question as slowly as possible. Um, who's first? Yes, sir. Please stand. Uh, I'm Al Davis of Harris County Historical Commission. Uh, Dr. Ramos spoke about the uh, following the same center, the, the loyalty oath. Was there any, uh, are you aware of any other uh, more extreme measures, say um, confiscation of property or land, anything like that? The question had to do with the loyalty oath, which uh, Dr. Ramos spoke about with regard to the head rights that America, that, uh, that Tejanos, uh, as citizens of the Texas Republic, received. Uh, I just might interject, giving them more critical seconds, that under the Texas Constitution, loyalty and citizenship and the ability to hold land were all tied together. Uh, if you could not prove your loyalty, you couldn't be a citizen. If you were never, weren't a resident citizen, you couldn't hold land. This became an especially tight situation 
for those uh, Tejanos, uh, especially in South Texas, who were accused of not participating or not participating on the right side during the revolution. And Al also asked whether there were other uh, uh, burdens uh, perhaps put on uh, these, uh, these Tejano citizens of the Republic, including perhaps as far as confiscation of lands. Well, my, again, my interest has mostly been just in San Antonio um, and what happened there. Or it's very exciting to be in an event like this where you have the general land office, for instance, uh, with a booth here, that where you have a lot of these documents where you, you can trace where these titles begin. And one of the things that the Texas Republic was very serious about was maintaining the integrity of, of land uh, claim or land titles to the Spanish period. So, so there was, on the one hand, this, this desire to, uh, to re retain the land that had been granted through, beginning with the Spanish period through to, to, the, to, the, to that point. Now, in terms of loss of land, uh, there's other uh, historians um, have written about uh, the, the areas in South Texas and, and, and uh, the different ways both uh, legitimate, coercive, and illegal at times that, that uh, resulted in the loss of land for many of the Tejanos there. I'll refer you to, well, the, the sort of Ur text at this point is a uh, Montejanos uh, book, David Montejanos book on Anglos and Mexicans in the making of Texas. But in terms of San Antonio, what I'm interested in is what happens with these head rights. Um, and, a very, and a very interesting, uh, I, I, I was trying to go through the process of what so, someone in San Antonio, a Tejano who spent all their life living there, would do with a right to some land that's way out there somewhere. It's, you know, these, 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 head, these land grants were not close by. There were, they were in un, they were in land that had not that you know an open land that hadn't been granted yet, so it was basically an abstract concept, and what I find is what my what I was what I was looking at in terms of just those head rights, um, is that you had a couple of folks who went in, Davenport was one and I can't remember the other one off the top of my head, um, who and and in fact Seguin also to to a certain extent. We're going through and buying the head rights from folks. I mean, what would you rather have, this land somewhere out there or the money for this land now in the present? And, uh, and at the same time, how would you know what to value it? And, uh, and uh, they were an over a barrel in that regard. So many of, if not most of the Tejanos signed off their, their, their head rights uh, in the Republic period, which for me, has symbolic value because uh, one of the things that head rights symbolized to me was an investment. I, I am a shareholder, if you will, in the Republic of Texas. Mm -hmm. And it was Tejanos sort of being ambig ambivalent about what their share in that Republic of Texas would be or could be in, in the future. Bruce, did you want to comment? I just might add one, one, uh, one comment, and that is uh, some of the loss of land took place in the loss of the ejidos, mm -hmm. or the common land uh, which had been shared by all Tejanos in their communities. So one of the things that happens in the immediate aftermath of the Texas Revolution is that a lot of Anglos start running for city council in what had been Mexican towns, Mexican places like Goliad, San Antonio, Victoria. There's a great, a great good bit of coercion that goes on with that as well. Um, and uh, a good many uh, Tejanos are moving out of Nacogdoches because they're coming under a great deal of trouble. And of course, there's the Cordoba Rebellion in 38, which has to do with tensions associated with both lots of new people moving in and the vulnerability of those land holdings. But in San Antonio, there are a couple of Anglos, whose names I don't remember right now. I, one of them may have been William Henry Dangerfield, but I don't recall. Anyway, they, they run for the city council and they get elected. And they immediately move to do the same thing that Anglos on these other city councils have done, and that is sell the ejido. Take the common land where people have grazed their animals and where there's their shared resources and sell them off to individuals. Very often these individuals would be them and their cronies. Uh, this is a fairly common pattern in history. And what happened is that because San Antonio, largely due to the efforts of Juan Seguin, because San Antonio 
maintained a fairly stable Tohono majority and a Tohono majority on the city council, that move was voted down. And those two guys immediately resigned. In other words, they get on the city council, they, they vote to sell city land to themselves and their buddies, and when, the, and when the motion fails, they immediately resign. That tells you something about some of the kind of, of, of legal and political consequences of that, uh, of that change that took place. Well, ultimately, the, the problem was in the American legal system and concept of private property, there was no room for this communal land that, uh, that uh, in the same way that the Spanish system that Mexico had inherited um, had. So it was a partially due to the, the, new, the new legal system. Sure. Yes, ma'am. I have a comment. That's, that's a great uh, example of, of just how uh, shaky the situation was at that time. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you were, that your family prevailed in that. I apologize for not repeating the question, but Estea, I think most people heard you. Uh, <laughs> and I, want to know, I want you to know that the land grant, that it was one lead and one neighbor mm -hmm. in Warren County by the Colorado River. Right. Um, I will say that uh, <laughs> for those of you who know Wharton, you may know that uh, right on the Colorado River in Wharton is a fabulous Mexican restaurant uh, today. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about the word massacre, the word execution. Many of us, the Hanos, had relatives fighting on both sides of the battle lines, and yet, and we know that Mexico had a law that anybody caught with a gun or racing arms against the government was going to be executed. <coughs> now, this man that were executed on the Spanish, the Spanish man. They always portray them as being massacred, and the Mexicans were a bunch of savage killers. Uh, what is your viewpoint? Let me repeat the question then from Benny Martinez, who is a descendant of the Canarios and uh, uh, from Goliad. And he's asked about the use of the term massacre to describe the execution of prisoners, which was ordered by Santa Ana at Goliad on Palm Sunday of 1836, following the capture of Fannin's men at the Battle of Coleto. I may have a little bit more of it. There's an amendment. <laughs> they always say that the killing was unjustified. And for no uh, good reason. Uh, and whether or not the killings were justified or with good reason. I got the question because I use the word massacre, and so I get to answer it. Um, yes, I use the word massacre, and I would stand by that. And let me just give some, as you were saying, you mentioned the law. There is, um, this is the complexity of this, this entire event. One of the things that had happened in October of 1835 was a series of uh, rallies in New Orleans in which volunteers were organized for Texas. And here in Texas, of course, we say, well, that's the New Orleans Grays because that's the com part of it that we know about. But also in New Orleans at that time, you had uh, the former vice president of Mexico. You had uh, Valentin Gomez Farias. Uh, Zavala happened to be there at that time, and so did uh, a general, general named Mejia. And Mejia 
organized an expedition that went to Tampico, and the purpose of going to Tampico was to support a Federalist revolution that by supporting the Federalist revolution in Tampico, then you would have support for the revolt in Texas. And this is a, um, an 1835 version of the Bay of Pigs, essentially, where the expedition lands, it attacks the city, it's defeated, Mejia leaves with most of his men, but he leaves behind about 32. And Santa Ana says, this should be, um, they should be treated as pirates. We're not at war with anybody, therefore, they're foreigners who are attacking us, they are pirates, and they should be treated accordingly. And the men who are captured at, at Tampico are executed. Now, how this is important is that this then becomes the doctrine, not just of Santa Ana, but the doctrine of the centralist Mexican government that has actually decreed that if you are caught, if you're a foreigner caught fighting against Mexico and you're armed, uh, therefore you will be treated as a pirate. And it doesn't say, and you will be executed, but it, it, it leaves the implication there. And that's why you have executions throughout the, uh, again, the despair that's being spread uh, leading up to San Jacinto is that as Urea's troops are coming from Matamoros, there are executions when they capture foreigners. Uh, at the, we often get asked about Crockett at the Alamo. Well, the point is, you know, not was Crockett executed or not, but there were executions. And the reason there were executions is it ties back to this Tornell decree. And people who study Urea are sort of like to say, well, he, he didn't want to kill them. And he was in somewhat of a quandary because he, they had so many of them, had nearly 400 of these American volunteers who had been captured. And it uh, doesn't mean that he hadn't carried out other executions. It's mainly, well, what do we do with this large of, of group? And so, as you said, you know, yes, these executions are carried out under a, uh, the, the order of the Mexican government, which the following month then revokes that order. So it's an order, but, and, and it, I guess what I would have to say is it comes up to, to personal interpretation that if you want to say they're only following orders you can say, well, it was a, a legal execution. If you are of the mind that marching unarmed prisoners out and, and killing them is, is something beyond the pale in warfare, uh, then it's, it's a massacre. So I, I don't think I can convince you that it's, that it's not a massacre, nor can you convince me that it is uh, something other than that. Let me say one more thing and then shut up. You have that permission, yes. At this point now, you know, up in Huntsville, they already executed over 300 unarmed prisoners. Is that a message? Uh, the, the, the question has to do with the legality of executions. I let, I'll, I'll throw my two cents worth here uh, in before we get another question. And, and the people I would, I, would, uh, I would defer to are Mexican soldiers. Uh, Urea, General Urea, Jose Enrique de la Peña, Nicolás de la Portilla, uh, who was in charge of the killings at, at, uh, at Goliad, uh, Manuel Castrillon, uh, who attempted to save the lives of some defenders at the Alamo. All of these Mexican officers spoke not of the legality of the killings of prisoners after these battles, they spoke of morality and they spoke of stupidity. Uh, de la Pena wrote his diary because he thought that cruelty and incompetence on the part of the highest levels of the Mexican high command had lost Texas for them. As a Mexican patriot, he objected to those executions. And I'd leave you with the words of Nicolas de la Portilla in his diary, cruel contraste. What a cruel contrast when he got the two sets of orders from Urea saying, protect the prisoners, and the orders in triplicate from Santa Ana saying, 
make sure that the executions take place. So legality is one parameter, but it's not the only parameter. Yes, sir. Did not Urea in his conflict of negotiations with Panis on the surrender agree to parole? No, sir. That's what uh, the question was whether Urea, whether Urea in the capitulation of Fannin's men agreed to a parole. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to E.C. Barker. Uh, E.C. Barker found the document in Mexico signed by Fannin, and it does not contain that parole, nor does it guarantee them anything but the discretion of the Mexican government. All of Fannin's men clearly thought there was some kind of agreement but it's not in the document that Fannin signed. It, it's one of those things that has come into the traditional story that, that it was guaranteed, but it was not guaranteed. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a comment and part of part of it your question. Uh, the reason why I came in from the gentleman on the far left is uh, talking. His uh, presentation, he kept using the word Tejano and he used the word Mexican, Mexican Tejano. And uh, I'm from the viewpoint, and a very strong viewpoint, that is that a Tejano and a Mexican is not one of the same. For 300 years, Tejas was named by the Spanish. For 300 years, the lady that sat over there and they made the statement about her, her uh, piece of land in the family. <coughs> They were Tejanos, they were Tejanos living in this area, in this area, long before Mexico became the country in 1821. So this is one of the things that I have a problem with when I hear people like yourselves, historians, teachers, authors, use of the state and making the claim that a Tejano and a Mexican is one of the same, and I strongly disagree with that. And I would like for you all to, to appear to that and start recognizing those of us that uh, have our roots here in Texas, for example, I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas, born and raised in Laredo, Texas. And I adopted the, name, the middle name of Tejano. My name now is Rudy Tejano Pena. I'm the only Tejano in the room. Again, I hope most of you could hear that question. I think it was fairly loud. I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but I want to uh, let uh, Raul Ramos, who studied this issue, first uh, address this question of nomenclature and identity and nationality. Well, th thank you for your comments, Mr. Pena. I, um, I, I, and I think I said something about it at the very beginning of my comments because I realized that this is a, a very tricky question. And, tr and again, because we're dealing with so many individual or family experiences that are not all the same, not only in terms of when and where, but also where and under what flag, under what period. Um, you know, I, one of my interests really, I agree with you and I'm very interested in, and in fact, the title of my book is How Norteños Become Tejanos, or my dissertation. Um, th this but I think there's a, a first step, and the first step is that there's a much greater connection with people in the whole north of, of, the, col of the Spanish colony, uh, from Saltillo uh, to Matamoros to San Antonio. Um, and that connection is, is is not only a business connection, it's not only a government connection, it's a, you, you see people getting married, you know, my wife is from Saltillo, my, uh, you know, my, my in-laws are in Matamoros, there's, there's these deep, deep connections that go back generations and generations, not to mention people going back and forth. Some, you know, you could have been born in San Antonio and, and raised your family in Saltillo and stayed in Saltillo, are you Tejano, are you Norteño? It defies easy explanation. What my, um, my disclaimer at the beginning, if you will, my, uh, of, of my comments were that I was using Tejano as a shorthand. And, and I said that, I said, 
um, you know, people then didn't call themselves Tejano necessarily. You're, you would be a Bejareño first. You would be, you know, your local place, your town was more important than your s district, you know. S it, it, and so um, you see people calling themselves, or, uh, let me put it this way, what people call themselves then, and I would say in the present, has a lot to do with who you're talking to. Um, it's, it's a sociological uh, phenomenon of, of, of uh, in-group, out-group, and you know, within your, you know, between, um, between family members, you refer to yourself in one way. Between your, your buddies, you refer to yourself in another way. Between, with somebody who is not of your ethnicity, you refer to yourself in an even different way. That, that's something that, again, it's not consistent, but that sociologists have documented happens. So the problem as a historian is I have to write in a way that everybody will understand who I'm talking about. And, as, and I think the important thing is from, the, you know, from page one, and I think this is what you're suggesting, from page one, be clear about what terms you're using and why and, that, and I think I said, that term does not necessarily represent the people I'm talking about. It's my shortcut of talking about the people of Mexican descent in this area called Texas. Um, but that's a really long way of saying, and to have to say that every time is, is, would, be, would hurt my hand, but would also take too long to speak. And so I think, so my shortcut is, is Tejano, but I, I sympathize with your, with your concern, and I think um, it's one that really brings out a longer issue that has to do with waves of immigration, with connections with Mexico. Um, and I think it's such a long history that, uh, you know, you can go down the line, you know, there's people who were here uh, before it was, uh, you know, in the early colonial period, um, people who come in the Mexican period, people who uh, come in, after, uh, after uh, 1847, big ma massive migrations in, in the 1880s uh, it, when railroads come in. Uh, you know, the Mexican Revolution is another migration wave. Um, it has to do with, with, with uh, economies. I mean, it's such a complicated and rich and interesting question. And I think my interest is in getting more people, Mexican and not Mexican, to, to be concerned about this and to write about it accurately. and. Uh, to, to, to try to answer that question, because I think if you can answer that question for the past, you'll answer a lot of questions about the present, and, and I think you're, you're right to bring that up. Bruce? No, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. The, uh, one of the problems with uh, interpreting history is that the labels that we use by necessity to, to describe people, sometimes rather than describing people, misdescribe them. And so if we say, like I, like I said earlier, if we say Texan, well, which type of Texan are you speaking of? Uh, again, when we say, when we talk about Mexicans in the, in the 19th century, we're all of the mind that uh, everybody is the, is the same when they're not. There's a great regionalism. The uh, uh, Lamar I, is a person that I've been working with a little lately. And one of the things that he talks about when he's still in Georgia is he says that there are two basic systems of government. And he's just involved in, been involved in the nullification crisis where South Carolina threatened not to pay the national tariff. And Jackson said, well, yes, you are. I'm going to use the army. But he says that there are two systems of government that are at odds. One is the system where you are loyal to your region, and then you will cooperate with the general government for the good of of the commonwealth or the good of the, of the whole. And he says what they're trying to do, he's against this, what they're trying to replace is to break down the regionalism and to replace it with uh, allegiance to the national or the general government with less allegiance to your state. So he says, you know, what's going on in the 19th century as he sees it is that they're trying to overturn this system of federalism. Well, the th interesting thing is you start looking at Mexican history and you see the same arguments being made. And one of the things that happens is happening at this time is that 
Texas is dissatisfied at being lumped in with Coila, and so part of the Texas Revolution really is not a secession movement in the beginning to get away from Mexico, but to break the bonds with Coila and to assume, like you said, their own identity. And so this is something that often gets overlooked in, in the, just the generalization of history. One of the things that makes uh, Texas history so fascinating for us and so impenetrable to some outsiders uh, are the ironies and ambiguities having to do with identity. And I will take about 30 seconds to pick up on two things you said to mention those. One is that the Mexicans came in, eight, came in in 1821. The other was your reference to Laredo. When Stephen F. Austin came, when Moses Austin came to Texas in 1820, he went to San Antonio and talked to the Spanish governor. When Stephen Austin came a year or two later, he had to talk to a Mexican governor. But it was the same dude. <laughs> it was the same guy. The Spanish governor had become the Mexican governor. And you've got to remember also that Laredo became a part of Texas due to the military might of the United States of America. That boundary used to be at Castroville between Texas and other parts of Mexico. Laredo, only because of the military might of the United States Army in the war with Mexico, was incorporated into Texas when the, when the United States made that Rio Grande the boundary, which it had not been before. Uh, yes, sir. We all know that the pen is higher than the sword. And when educated scholars like y'all very educated, keep using these ugly words, like the word massacre, it perpetuates and keeps that thing going. When we use words hurt, everyone knows that words hurt. So that's one of the reasons that we bring this word up all the time. Because I live in Kodiak. We have snowbirds that come through here. They've never heard about Texas, but once they go to that procedure and they come out and they see the word massacre all over the wall, they come out hating the massacre. And I know it because I'm a dozen across the street at Zaragoza house. And they come in and they say, those Mexicans are so bad, so dirty, bloodthirsty murderers. So we have to give them education. We have to give education about the real issues, but it's just the word that is used. William, do you have a question? <laughs> yes. Why do y'all continue to use those words when y'all are so highly educated and they keep hurting people why? I've sworn off on, uh, on, on some words uh, in Texas history, um, uh, and, and some of the others I use for convenience, as Raul and, uh, and, uh, and Bruce just, just suggested. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, each, each of us, as individuals, PhDs or not, have to decide what words we're going to use, and it, it, it really becomes a matter of mutual education which is an ongoing process, I understand, in Goliad, uh, and uh, an individual responsibility. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Chris, we spoke earlier, and, and I'm no scholar. I teach Texas history for the seventh grade. And let me assure all of you that in my seventh grade Texas history class, we look at the Texas Revolution from both perspectives. And to me, that's what we're hearing. We've heard all along with all these children's comments. It's a perspective issue. It's how you look at it. And it's from what point of view that you address that. And it's important for our young people to realize that there's always more than when we're connected to the ages that are going to be So to reassure you, the third of the time is I'm very honest to be able to drive to educate our kids on both sides. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Could, could, could you stand, please? It's my understanding that the generals protested the killing of the Spanish men and tried not to kill them and were very disgusted when Santa Ana sent them a direct order that they had to do it. And so they were, in my mind, compassionate, and the only bad guy here was Santa Ana, and I think mean, we had a right to call him a bad guy. The, the, this is a somewhat a repeat of the earlier statement that there were several Mexican officers who disagreed with and, 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 and regretted uh, the killings at, uh, at Goliad, and it was ordered directly by Santa Ana. 
Is there a question? Yes, sir. Um, Bill Howard. Uh, I enjoyed Dr. Ramsey's reference to the perception gaps and how sometimes they are genuinely justified uh, as he extended to the foreign view of Mexico. Remember, I'm going to have to repeat. Uh, if we hear concern about words have impact, and we hear that seemingly the, uh, the general Mexican officers were extremely compassionate and very focused. It seemed to be that Santa Ana was the primary problem. So were there words, deeds, or proclamations that Santa Ana performed, wrote, or published? that would help us distinguish between his brutality and killings in Zacatecas, which we could have to cover his political correctness for his dictatorship, and his brutal killings in Tejas. Did he particularly choose to say things differently about the folks in Texas from how he might describe the folks in Zacatecas? Mr. Howard's question is focused on Santa Ana and whether Santa Ana's words, uh, perhaps, as well as his deeds, uh, had something to do with the level of brutality or the, uh, or the uh, representation of what was going on uh, in, in Texas. Um, and uh, uh, compa the comparison was made between the reputed uh, 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 brutality in Zacatecas in 1835 and that which took place uh, in, uh, in, in uh, allegedly in Texas in 1836. Um, uh, this reminds me very much of some of the recent work of Jack Jackson in talking about uh, the alleged so-called ethnic cleansing in Texas in 1836. Would either one of you like to pick up that hot potato? Did Santa Ana? Yeah, did, did Santa Ana make a, make a distinction between what his army was doing in Zacatecas in putting down the Federalist militia in 35 and what his army was doing in Texas. Specifically, I take it with, the, with, the, with reference to that iron hand that was being used in the ordering of executions and the carrying out of the Tornell Decree. I, let me put it in a broader context. One of the, the problems with studying the Texas Revolution or the war with Mexico or this period is because it, it becomes very easy to say that Santa Ana, he's a bad guy. And he becomes more or less the sponge for, for everything. And that if you say, put things off on Santa Ana, then it absolves everybody else. Um, one of the things that, that is happening in, in Mexico with Mexican scholars is they're beginning to look at this time period and go deeper than just saying, it's the age of Santa Ana and he's everything, but to saying every strong man has a support system. You know, who are the people behind Santa Ana? And begin to sort of unravel that. And this decree that, that decrees that there will be executions is called the Tornell Decree. You mentioned Tornell. Uh, who is Tornell? He turns out to be fairly, very powerful, uh, he, but he's in the background. And so he doesn't make it into uh, general history books. And so scholars will know who he is, but, but he's not out there necessarily in the general um, perception of this time period. And so that's one of the things that really needs to be done, is there needs to be some work done on that time period to say, what is the political hierarchy? Who's in charge? Who's doing this? Because uh, as we all know, one of the things that happens with Santa Ana when he does come into power, he gives the power up and goes, I used the word Camp David the other day and as, as, a, as a reference, but essentially he goes to his, his, his home and rests and turns the government over to other people. Um, so, so there needs to be a better understanding of the me Mexican political system. One of the things that that you may not know is we, you know, we talk about General Urea and we have him at Goliad and, and then sort of leave him there. But uh, I mentioned Mejia, General Mejia. Mejia and Urea are later involved in a Federalist revolution against Santa Ana. They're both defeated. Urea is allowed to come back into the centralist government 
as an army officer, Mejia is executed by Santa Ana. So, so there's, there's much more at work behind the scenes than sort of traditionally what we know. And what I would offer is the more that you begin to, to, to dig deeper into this, the more it becomes a real event. And often, uh, it, sometimes when you do research, it, it, it opens up new questions for you that you don't have an answer for, but you didn't even know the question existed before you started the research. And so it really is an educational process. Just, just to echo that, the, the, the perception is that Mex the 19th century history of Mexico is chaos. And part of that is it's a lazy way not to have to do work and really figure it out and see how it works. Um, sure, from the outside, it looks incredibly chaotic. But if you take the time, especially to break down the regions, because Mexico has always been a country of regional histories, and to this day continues to be a, a, a country of, of regional histories, um, much more so than the United States. I mean, here we talk about sectionalism. I mean, in Mexico, it means a whole lot more than in the United States. Um, we see that, in fact, what we have are local leaders, be they military leaders, caudillos, political leaders of other sorts, uh, hacendados, uh, big hacienda uh, owners. Um, we need to look at where power is located and how they gain power and how they maintain that power. And that power is sometimes maintained economically. Sometimes that power is maintained brutally. Um, certainly, you know, the, I, th I think to talk about the federalist, centralist divide as, as only political factions uh, under plays or, you know, doesn't do justice to just how violent it was at times. I mean, our, you know, uh, people marshalling troops, as it were, and sometimes those troops were the people working on your ranch. You know, that, that, that's how you um, establish power, maintain power. I mean, there's a point right uh, before um, the, the uh, Texas War of Secession that um, Coahuila y Texas has two capitals, one in Monclova and one in Saltillo. Well, Monclova capital is a federalist capital, and, and in Saltillo, they, uh, they, the centralists are getting together. Two legislators, you know, at, at, I mean, that's how things were going. And, and if you look, there were a lot of Tejanos and a few Ang Anglo-Texans involved in that Monclova uh, Congress. So it's it, really what you need to do. The, the, the answer, uh, you know, to echo is, is uh, 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 what Dr. Winters is saying is um, you need to really go deeper than, than just um, Santana, Santana's brutality makes everyone else heroic. Or, or you know, that's, you know, every, there's a lot of heroic people. There's a lot of people dying all over the place uh, unjustly um, or valiantly. Um, w you know, to, to make one more important than the other it, is to ignore the complicated story that, that's going on in Mexico at this time. I have two people who I've recognized by knowledge. The gentleman here and then the lady in the back will be next. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Joe Spriggan from uh, San Antonio College. Could you comment exactly on maybe on Andrew Jackson's policies during the Texas Revolution? Didn't he try to keep America at the national level neutral at this? Of course, Americans were not neutral, but maybe talk about him and both his major military commander of Louisiana, General James, and their activities vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Texas Revolution. The question has to do with uh, President Jackson's uh, policy and posture towards the Texas Revolution and specifically uh, how that policy and posture might be carried out by General, uh, is it Edmund? Edmund P. Edmund Gaines at uh, Fort uh, Camp, Fort Jessup in, on the Louisiana border. Jackson's involvement in the, in the war is one of those things that historians debate. There are some people that have a whole conspiracy theory that, that he sent Sam Houston to Texas to to start the revolution and uh, that, that assumes a great deal of power and that things will go right. Um, there are other people that tend to look at it and, and as you said, look at these policies. 
the rather than Jackson's policies, it's it's more the attitude of Americans towards Texas. And there had been this general idea that that Texas was somehow an appendage of the United States and would always be reattached. One of the things that had happened in this treaty in, in 1819 in between Spain and the United States was the Spanish made a, a deal that they thought was pretty good. They would give the United States Florida in return for the United States having a hands-off poly of te policy of Texas. And that was a, a great bargain, except two years later, it's not, it's not Spain anymore. And so many people in, in the United States, even though this treaty existed, they, they viewed it as being somehow a, a, a bad deal and that Texas was a part of the United States. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that this justifies people moving into Texas, but in their mind, it was reclaiming territory had, that had been given away, much like today when you have immigrants coming from, from the South going, well, Texas was a part of Mexico, I'm just going home. And, and, but it, so, it, so it's that underlying popular idea of what this territory represents. Now, the gains, one of the things that had happened was um, the Cherokees and other tribes in Texas uh, both the insurgents and the government wanted them at, to either be, be neutral or at best to be on their side. And uh, there were indications that the centralist government had agitated among the Indians and said, these people are your enemies, uh, you know, you need to join us and, and we'll take care of you. And Gaines evidently had been given the instructions that if there were hostilities breaking out in Texas, then he could enter Texas with U.S. troops to protect the U.S. border. And, and that's what happens. That's the, and the, the incident that, that kicks Gaines' entrance off into Texas is the very famous Fort Parker episode with Cynthia Ann Parker. But that, that brings Gaines in, but they don't really stay that long, but, but it does in the summer of 36. In summer of 36. But that does give people in Mexico the idea of, of, like you said, I told you so. I told you that Jackson was had designs on Texas. He sent General Gaines to support the rebels. So it, it, there, there, it's one of those areas that there is a lot more to be done or could be done. And there's some being done right now. Some of the most interesting material that uh, the famous researcher Tom Lindley has found recently are claims for pensions from couriers who are going back and forth between Sam Houston and Edmund Gaines during the end of winter and beginning of spring of 1836. In other words, in February of 36, I don't think old Sam is just talking to the Cherokee. Uh, uh, and if you look at the letter that he sent from Louisiana when he stepped across the border in 1833 and wrote a letter to, to General Jackson, he said, I'm gonna be your eyes and ears down here. That doesn't mean he's got a plan to start a revolution. But he also says in that letter, I'm gonna make sure that nothing gets in the way of your plan of making sure that Texas eventually comes into the United States. So he's a, he is a conscious, I'd imagine you may disagree with me this afternoon, but I don't think you can read that letter without him seeing, without seeing Sam Houston as a conscience, conscious agent of Andrew Jackson's desires. That doesn't mean there's a plot and a plan but he's looking out. Yes, ma'am. My name is Ann Sutherland, and I'm an anthropologist from Georgia State University. And I wanted to come back to the more general issue of the Texas Territory and the Texas Yes, ma'am. When I go to Texas, I come back to the Texas Territory and the Texas Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to come back to the more general issue of the Texas Territory and the Texas Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to come back to the more general issue of the Texas Territory and the Texas Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to come back to the more general issue of the Texas Territory and the Texas Yes, ma'am. Anthropologist Ann, anthropologist Ann Sutherland, uh, who's come from Georgia, is that what you said? Uh, to ask us uh, if, if growing up in Texas she was misinformed when she was 
told that the Alamo was a turning point, uh, or is San Jacinto to the turning point? Greg Demick and I have our own turning points that you'll hear about later. Uh, but uh, she's asked our speakers uh, how to address that issue of a turning point in the Texas Revolution. Well, the, the, fir the first, uh, I think, response is uh, uh, the San Jacinto uh, Committee is paying our bills, so uh, <laughs> San Jacinto was the turning point. Um, but, but seriously, to, to echo uh, Dr. Winter's point here, the, the, um, it depends on who you're talking about, turning point for who. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to give my short answer and turn it to the Alamo uh, curator. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say in my 400-page manuscript, um, I have one paragraph on the Alamo. Uh, it, you know, part of it was I feel so much had been written about, but in the story, but the point I'm making is in the Tejano story, it, it's it's a blip in a larger, uh, in a larger story for the for the Mexican inhabitants of of Texas. It. It somewhat depends on, on the scope of what you're looking at. If you're looking at just the Texas Revolution, then I think you could probably make an argument that the Alamo would be a symbolic turning point. Uh, if you're looking at the broader context of, of relations between Mexico and Texas and the United States from, say, 1821 up to 1848, then you might be able to say, to, to move that a bit and say, well, San Jacinto was was important, and and so it really depends in the context of of where you want to put your turning point. Uh, one of your fellow anthropologists, uh, Michel Rolf Trujillo, uh, said in his book uh, Silencing the Past that when Santa Ana lost at San Jacinto, he lost two battles. He not only lost the battle that day on April 21st, but he lost the right to tell you what the Battle of the Alamo was all about. Because he had won that battle, and had he won later, he would have given you a different history. Uh, and and um, uh, one thing I, I should mention is that, uh, with regard to the question, to the answers uh, just stated, uh, uh, PBS and the American Experience are going to be putting on uh, uh, an hour special. I think they're going to call it "Remember the Alamo." I hope not, uh, but uh, it's a it's it's a sort of the unremembered Alamo. And that's the experience of the people of San Antonio de Beja from the 18 teens through the 1840s. Uh, and it'll be on sometime in the next academic year. Uh, and it's focusing on Jose Antonio Navarro and the other Tejanos who were a part of the revolution. Did you have a follow up question? Uh, well, I, I, I have to look into this, and I view it more as a shared set of uh, the Alamo and the Alamo Yeah, Holly, Holly Breer talks a good bit in her book uh, uh, on uh, the title of which has just uh, Inherit the Alamo, uh, about Texan Lent, uh, which runs from Alamo to San Jacinto, uh, with the, the death and, and resurrection, in, in essence, of, uh, of that, the sacrifice and the resurrection. And there's a, there is, as, as uh, Bruce and Raul just said, a great deal of symbolic importance to that Alamo battle. But if it hadn't been for what happened at San Jacinto, we'd be looking at different symbols and different stories of what had happened at the Alamo. Yes, no, that's a cameraman with his hand up. Joshua. <laughs> I'm Joshua Alford from Seattle. Uh, I have a question to either you or even to guests about what confers legitimacy on ownership of land. And for example, you might say, and I, I puzzle about, uh, it might be said that Texas was stolen but Mexico got it from Spain, and where did Spain get it? And some might argue that Spain stole it from whoever lived there. And so when you're trying to unravel wrongs done, and you certainly have this in the Middle East, you know, the Israelis, the Palestinians, go all the way back to the East, the Romans, how do you establish who rightfully owns the land? Uh, Joshua Alper, who has come to us not from Hollywood, his assistant is there, but, his, uh, but Joshua has come to us from Seattle. 
uh, ask about how to establish the, or how to talk about the legitimacy of the ownership of land because usually the stealer is also the stealee, uh, or uh, that's not a very elegant way of putting it, but most people who say they took my land probably uh, is descended from someone who took it from someone else. How do you deal with this conundrum of legitimacy and ownership? Going back to my geologic training, it's actually the trilobites who do that. <laughs> It's a question that's hard to answer because, as you all know or should have a sense of, is that there, there are points that history bleeds over into politics slash uh, interest. And so uh, it, it would be very easy at some point to say, well, of course, it's obvious whoever has a deed is the owner. But then there, but there are bigger issues at stake, such as uh, rectifying wrongs that society has done and things like that. And, and so it, it, there really isn't an answer. And so there can be interpretations, but there, there just can't be a definitive answer that I'm aware of. I've thought about that question a whole lot. I came from Clay County, and I've also often wondered where my dad got that land. Not much land, but a little bit of it. And essentially, he got it from LaSalle, as far as I can figure out. Uh, you know, when LaSalle claimed Louisiana for France, you couldn't hear his voice a quarter of a mile away. And yet he was claiming Cherokees and Sioux and Cheyenne and uh, people all over North America. And then that boundary was, you know, after the sale uh, out from the hands of the Spanish to the to the United States, then that boundary was adjudicated on the Red River and then the, and, and a different... Uh, political authority got it, but uh, as far as I can figure out, you know, if you, trace, if you trace titles back, it goes back to the Sieur de la Salle, uh, asserting that European claim uh, to the central part of North America, where we are right now. I saw a hand somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Dennis Jaffray. I'm from Houston. I'm a member of the Sons of the Republic of Texas. I have a question for Dr. Ramos and for uh, Dr. Winders, it's been brought up about the two invasions, I guess you would call them, of the city of San Antonio during the time of the Republic of Texas. 1842. Yes, sir. Well, my question is, I've never had a clear understanding of why the central government of Mexico never exploited those opportunities. The question has to do with the, the two times that San Antonio was occupied by the Mexican army in the spring and then again in the fall of 1842 and why the country of Mexico didn't follow up on what might seem to be an opportunity given that foothold in Texas. Right. Um, the two things, um, one on what happened during those two in invasions um, and a second on, on um, your question of, of what, why, um, why they weren't per more permanent perhaps or didn't end somehow differently. The first is very interesting. You have, um, in, first in, Va in the Vasquez, um, which was the shorter of the two occupations, um, you, you, ha you have these, um, um, this very explicit, and, and, and it happens in Wall as well, but this very explicit claim that Mexicans are coming in, the Mexican military is coming into San Antonio because they've heard and they've gotten reports and uh, that Mexicans are being mistreated, are being, uh, are being, um, uh, you know, discriminated basically against. Di discriminated against. I, I was trying to think of a, a better word for the time period, but discriminated uh, is perfect. Yes, they're, they were not give, being given a fair shot. They were being, um, they did have city council seats, but they didn't have the mayor. Um, why is that, you know, was this deals that were going on, but they were being thrown in jail. Uh, they were not getting, uh, they were not getting basically equal access to um, well, their city. Was it not the case that in the Vasquez, the first, uh, Seguin was the mayor? 
Right. That I was I was gonna think of, of Wool of the of oh, Sm when Smith becomes uh, Smith becomes mayor first and then Seguin Seguin, Seguin, Seguin is Seguin mayor. Is right. His second term as mayor in forty two. Right. But what happens is um, well two thing uh, one one thing happens is a lot of Tejano families leave San Antonio with Vasquez and travel back across the border. I don't know where they end up. I think a lot of them end up in Nuevo Laredo. Um, I, I haven't fully traced that. But there's a, basically, uh, it, it's a stage of, you know what, this Texas th Republic thing's not working out for us. We're gonna sort of cut our losses and, and go. And here's our chance here. You know, they're offering this, come back. Um, with Wall, they, it's longer and they capture, uh, they imprison a, a, a lot, of many of the Anglo, um, I, I think they were mostly uh, soldiers that were quartered in, in San Antonio at the time, um, and, for, and forced them to sign uh, an, a, a letter uh, saying that they were treated very well while Wool was there, that, uh, and not only that, but they promised in the future to treat Mexicans who are still in San Antonio well in, in the future. So there's this very interesting um, you know, ethnic overtone to that, and, and whether it's real politics, you know, whether the, it was a, a way of legitimizing it, or whether they were really responding to these reports they were getting of discrimination, um, that I, I think that's, it's a little harder to tell. I haven't found th that evidence, but I'm assuming, we, we have to assume some sincerity. Now, on the second point of why it didn't last, I think I alluded to, the, to my feeling, at least, that on the one hand, Mexico just wasn't unified, uh, didn't, wasn't able to, to mount a serious program uh, one way or another. It was almost, it was a sort of band-aid, as it were, for, for really a lot of indecision or counter decisions that were being bantied around at the time. And on top of that, Mexico was heavily, heavily in debt. And the debt was getting big, larger and larger and larger. And um, it was gonna be an expensive, Every day, it would be a more expensive venture to, to, to keep a foothold in, in Texas. I just add that after the immediate aftermath of the revolution, there's no events in the Texas Republic that have a greater impact on the lives of Tejanos, if I can use that term, uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the native Spanish-speaking people of Texas than those uh, invasions of 42 and the resignation of Juan Seguin and his return in the second invasion, his resignation as mayor and his return with the Mexican ar army in the second invasion of 42. I'm not gonna explain why it's so it's enormous, but on the lives of Tejanos and on the position of Tejanos in the Texas Republic, nothing had a greater impact than that event six years after the revolution. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Green. I grew up in Northeast Texas on land that Sam Houston was given by the Republic of Texas. About 20 years ago, it was taken away from my mother by eminent domain, so I do understand. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our Tejano or Hispanic friends, as I call them, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a Tejano. That's a current term for a Mexican who lives in Texas and feels they're Texan. But what I think we need to do is concentrate on things that will stop the divisiveness in our history and learn to tell it in a way that tells the story uncolored but yet not offensive to each other. My question really is though from the historians is, was Sam Houston attempting to get to General Gaines and that's where the battle between the senators really been? <laughs> the, the question is the eternal one and that is, what was in Sam Houston's mind as he pushed east across Texas? <laughs> I think we may, our, 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 our responders have deferred that until the afternoon session when it will undoubtedly be more appropriate. And you may ask it again. Uh, we're not going to talk about last year. <laughs> Any other questions before we, yes sir. Can you please describe the uh, geographic area of the centralist and the federalist uh, at the time, during this time period or were the centralist truly <laughs> South or different regions, and the Federalist uh, thinkings were there more in line of separating uh, the country of Mexico, the then country of Mexico, into different parts, possibly aligning uh, with uh, 
you know, whoever was in power in the northern part of uh, the continent. The question has to do with the centralists and federalists in Mexico, how they might be defined in geographic terms and what their motivations and plans might be, perhaps even going as far as the of, dismemberment of Mexico, which of course happened to a certain degree, those of, of you from Laredo know, in the Republic of the Rio Grande uh, in the period of the Texas Republic. Bruce? The, uh, again, this may be one of those general overviews that that's useful, but it's, that's why I'm giving it to you. It is useful, though there may be caveats to it. But uh, going back to this idea of recreating the Spanish stability, uh, the seat of power for the vice royal had been Mexico City. And so Mexico City, be, and, and that swath across central Mexico becomes the uh, sort of the home for the centralist. And the Federalists are on the northern frontier and they're on the southern frontier. Uh, we don't talk very much about the Yucatan, but the Yucatan had also broken away from Mexico at that time and was attempting to set up its own republic. A and so it, it had to do, again, with what Rao talks about, is, is that the interest. It isn't necessarily just politics, but it's who you are allied to. And people, further from Mexico City felt a sense of autonomy that they were able to take care of their problems much more uh, quickly and cleanly than someone from down in Mexico City. And so, so there's a geographical component to, at, at play here. Right. And, and I just, just want to really quickly add that the centralist, and again, the centralist federalist division really means something. I mean, this colonial system during the Spanish period was one that was set up to particularly exploit those further areas. It was a, a funnel, if you will, um, that went into Mexico City. And so, you know, your shoes cost more in uh, Texas than if in Mexico City, even though the leather, the cow that gave you that leather was slaughtered in Texas. You know, it, it still had to go to Mexico City and come back, whether through taxes or, I mean, there was, it was, one, it was that system really meant something. And, and so it wasn't just a question of, of political philosophy in the abstract. It was about material needs and, and, and material reality, the economic interests of those people in that area as well. Those of you who haven't had an opportunity to ask questions this morning will get another opportunity, of course, this afternoon, not only with our afternoon speakers, Madge Roberts and Mike Campbell, but we're going to ask the technical people to get the second microphone working on this table uh, for the afternoon. I hope that was loud enough. And uh, all four of our speakers will be available at the table uh, following the presentation, uh, presentations of Madge Roberts and Mike Campbell this, this afternoon. Uh, we're scheduled to begin again here at 1 o'clock, but right now um, I am absolutely desperate for this man, Jeff Dunn, <laughs> I didn't see him the last time I looked, uh, to come up here and tell you how to get to lunch. Thanks very much. We certainly want to thank uh, our speakers and, and Jim. Uh, this is a wonderful program this morning. And I also want to thank the audience members who asked very perceptive questions. Uh, the one thing that we uh, know about Texas history is that uh, we Texans take our history seriously. And I think it's certainly evident by uh, the professors we have here, but also just the caliber of our audience. Uh, we will have the lunch up here in this balcony. Uh, Greg Dimmick will be uh, speaking around noon. Uh, there will be an opportunity now to e enjoy the exhibits in the back, um, but please try to migrate upstairs uh, so he can start around noon. And then uh, there, there are stairs in the back, and there's an elevator in the back as well that will take you upstairs. Um, and we will start back here at 1 o'clock, so thank you very much.